Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Yeah, we're going to call the meeting to order. And uh, look at the, first of all, we just want to um, have a motion for approval of the March 26, 2020 uh, minutes. We need, a roll call. A we need a roll call. Yeah, let's, let's do a roll call, yeah. Thank, thank you, Jerry. Roberta Abdul Salam. Present. Jim Durrett, Dr. Edmund, we have you. William Floyd. Patrick Frierson. Present. Ryan Glover. Terry Griffin. Here. Rita Hardage. Here. Alicia Ivey. Russell McMurray. Al Pine. Present. Rita Scott. Rita Scott. Rita Scott, hold on. Rita Scott. I heard her a minute ago. Yeah, she's showing up as being there. Rita Scott. Present. Christopher Thomason. Thomas Worthy. Thank you. Ms. Let's go, ahead and go to the approval of the March minutes. Is there a motion? So move, Jerry. Second. Uh, second. Yeah, okay. Fine. Mr. Pine, any discussion? Hearing none, are there any abstentions or voting no's? Hearing none, the minutes passed uh, unanimously. This is going to be a short meeting, uh, only a couple of business uh, points. So the first thing we're going to do is do a briefing uh, dealing with the City of Atlanta, uh, IGA, for the more MARTA experience, Mr. Rucker, Chief Capital Programs and Expansion and Innovation. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair. Committee Chairman Edmund, members of the board, and General Manager Parker. Good morning. I would like to, I would like to give an overview of the former intergovernmental agreement that has been collaboratively developed by members of the city and MARTA staff over the last two or three months. Okay, so we'll we'll go to slide two, which is just the agenda. We will talk about. Just real quickly, the background on previous IGAs associated between the two parties. We'll look at the purpose of this IGA. We'll look at roles uh, as we go forward in implementation of the program and next steps uh, after we basically uh, in, in the program as we progress the more modern program. So a bit about the background. We have two IGAs of note, one being the Atlanta Streetcar Transit Service Cooperative Agreement that was executed in 2011. Uh, with that agreement, basically it was not a transfer as well as the transition schedule for the streetcar service. We also had in 2018 the More MARTA Intergovernmental Agreement, which established roles and responsibilities of MARTA and the City of Atlanta for a More MARTA program. It established a program management office and a City of Atlanta liaison served as a framework for project prioritization and program implementation, and it established advisory committees that develop program and financing scenarios to implement the high capacity transit projects. Just as a note, this agreement supersedes both of those agreements, and it's, it's mentioned in the preamble of the, the IGA. Next page. So, so I want to spend a little look time and just go through a little bit of detail. My understanding is that everybody has a copy of the IGA. They're muted. They're muted. They're muted. Okay. All right. So, so the, the new IG and, and the purpose of the new GID, IG, IGA, I'm sorry. So number one, moving, it, it basically focuses on moving the program into project delivery mode. It, it defines responsibilities based on project phases and liability associated with each. 
Number three would be if you look at the IGA, paragraphs one to through through three, you find the parties of the agreement, which is basically civil Atlanta and martyr. Uh, it does make reference to ABI, where the Atlanta Beltline Incorporated will be a party when the, when the projects are within their right of ways. Basically, it, it identifies that MARTA will be the recipient of all federal grants associated with the expansion program. It defines goals, guiding principles of project delivery for the program. So when you get to paragraph four, which is a very important uh, paragraph, it basically defines the responsibilities of the MARTA board, which has final decision-making programs, final decision-making of, of all everything that affects the transit components of the program. It also defines the City of Atlanta subcommittee and the responsibilities of that group and the City of Atlanta subcommittee are those board members appointed by the mayor. So basically, Dr. Edmund, uh, Mr. Uh, board member Ash, board member Glover. It also, in, in, in 4.0, defines the government committee. And I'll go in, into detail, basically I got a slide at the back that basically gives the governor's committee who makes up that committee. But basically the governor's committee will make key project decisions and oversight of project milestones, proactively flag and address programmatic challenges and provide resolutions of potential conflicts. Now, again, 4.0 is very important because it also includes the requirement to establish and manage the program through a central pro, uh, program management office. It establishes uh, the need for a city of Atlanta liaison, similar to the previous agreement. Uh, it basically also establishes the requirement for project base agreements for each project, and it requires that MARTA ABI execute a master agreement between the two parties, as well as specific project base agreements for each project within the Beltline right away. Paragraph five basically defines what's considered as significant changes and just to summarize those, we, we also have to have collaboration when it comes to project delivery methodologies. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. In the exhibits, we take time to detail the various project phases. So you see initiation, planning, final design, and implementation, which is, which is basically a description of each subphase and the activities associated within those phases, as well as who has the responsibilities per organization. So for instance, in initiation, it varies by project, so basically, when you start looking at feasibilities and alternative analysis, dependent, it's sometimes the city of Atlanta would take the lead, sometimes MARTA would take the lead, sometimes ABI would take the lead. As you move through planning, primarily MARTA would take the lead in the planning process supported by the city of Atlanta. As we go into final design, you see that uh, the engineering will be led by MARTA supported by the city of Atlanta. The right of way, procurement of right of way will be led by the city with MARTA support. Condemnation, of course, will be done by the city with MARTA support. And implementation of the project, as you go to construction, MARTA will take that lead with city support. Vehicle procurement testing and startup will be MARTA's responsibility. I want to basically quickly go through the, the, the program governance. Next slide. And, and highlight the, the various tiers. Next slide. So this is the overall governance structure, and basically just want to point out that we will manage the projects through what we call the project technical committee. So I'm starting at the bottom and working my way up. All communication for the project will come through what we call the communications working group that will be be led by our our, our chief 
chief of staff, Melissa Mullinax, including external affairs. Now, that the direct communication with the city of Atlanta's city council's communication designee and office mayor of communication. So we will have a lot of interface and, again, collaborative interface between all parties. Basically, the program will be managed by what we call the program management team. It will be, it, that management team will consist of basically what we call the project management officer, which is the chief of capital programs, the AGMs of planning, delivery, and infrastructure. Basically, the city will have this representation there. Um, so it will be a collaborative group that basically manages every, every aspect of this program. Of course, the project management team will basically report up to the program governance committee. And the key thing there, that governance committee will be led by the GM, uh, modest GM, with support from chief of staff and, and basically chief of cap pro projects. From the city standpoint, you will have the chief operating officer and deputy chief operating operating officer. Uh, and if the project is is within the ABI right away, basically ABI will have a representation there. Also, you know, when there's a significant issue as defined by the changes in 5.0, basically those issues have to go to the City of Atlanta Subcommittee of the Model Board of Directors, and that primary responsibility will be to ensure that there's collaboration and discussion with the Office of the Mayor, basically any recommendations that has to be conveyed to the full Model Board through that committee uh, for a final decision, and of course, the model board of directors as you go to the very top will be the policy and program decision making authority basically for key milestones, financial reviews, and transportation mode decisions. Okay, with that, I think that completes the presentation. Hey, hey Mr. Rucker, we talked about this in the earlier pre planning meeting. Can you discuss with the board? You know, your thoughts about the fact that we're not going to have all the tax dollars that we projected in order to do all the things that are on the list and, and how we're going to approach any deficits and shortfalls by prioritizing plans and programs. Well, you know, as, as always, Dr. Dr. Edmonds, you know, this program has a requirement to be it's fiscally constrained, so therefore we always have to evaluate um, our, our program priorities, especially doing an evaluation of, of sales tax revenue receipts, et cetera. Now, the thing, what this program will require is basically we have to look to alternative funding and, and some of the things that we're considering, not only federal funding, but basically looking alternative financing. Do we, do we go out now and, and, and do some, something like a P3? where we get some third party financing for the project and basically look to see how we can actually, you know, extend the payment terms on those. So I'm not going to say we can't do everything just yet. You know, I think it's going to cause us to be creative and again to monitor sales tax that comes in and see whether or not the, the, the impacts of COVID uh, will, will basically impact us to the point where we have to go back and recycle. But, but I will say it will require us to be creative, and that's some of the things we're talking about now from a financial standpoint. Do any of the other board have Dr. any Eisen, comments? Can or, I, go, go, yes. Go, go, go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. This is Jeff. Yeah, no, no. Appreciate that. Um, I just, I just want to um, point out something that I think is, is important um, in shaping this agreement with the city. Um, is that at the end of the day, uh, MARTA will hold the fiduciary responsibility for delivering these projects. M many, many of them um, will, we will enter into full funding grant agreements with the FTA. That will be an agreement between MARTA and the FTA to deliver uh, a project um, and, and in return uh, receive federal funding to deliver that, that project. So. Um, you know, we've, we've really taken that into account in putting this agreement together because, if, if, you know, at the end of the day, the, the scope of the project, um, you know, has to be one that, that we can deliver um, and execute and, you know, conform to the requirements that the, that the FTA will, will put together. And I think that we've, you know, we put together 
you know, Frank, Frank leading a, a really, really collaborative effort with the city to, to develop what I think is a strong um, agreement that, that gives significant controls and influence to the city of Atlanta, which is appropriate, but, but recognizes that fiduciary responsibility that ultimately we will have on these projects. Thanks. Okay, appreciate it. Any other board members have any comments or questions about this? Let me ask a question. I, I'm assuming that uh, there is a conflict resolution process in looking at all of this. It's kind of built in, but there's there is a process that if there's a disagreement or between the city and and the MARTA staff over something that it that is a resolution process, so as to not bog down. There, there is, Mr. Griffin, and if you go to basically what, what we call paragraph four in the governance, it says, um, right. now I'll just quickly read it right quick. The Board of Directors will have ultimate responsibility for decisions affecting the transit components of the program. Okay. The Office of the Mayor will be apprised of any recommendations that will constitute a significant change or impact, and of course that's defined in paragraph five, to the transit components of the program at least 14 days before it presented to the to the city of Atlanta committee. So basically, okay. Basically, if the program sees a impact to something that's been agreed, you know, and it's significant, we will basically go to the general manager. The general manager will take it to the subcommittee of the Marta board. The Marta board will have that discussion with the office of the mayor, and then basically convey that discussion back to the chief board for discussion and decision. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair, this is Rod Frierson. I have a question. Go ahead, Mr. Frierson. Um, uh, Mr. Rucker, the, uh, you mentioned the Beltline project. Help me understand how does that uh, how does that fit in within the scope of this IGA, or is it something that's separate? Or help me understand how does that will that be folded into this? I think you might have said something of that nature. How does that connect? Okay, so so as you know. Some of the proposed expansion projects are within the Beltline right of ways. Right. So, so when we, <coughs> excuse me, the agreement requires that number one, we have a an overarching agreement between the Beltline and Martin. Mm -hmm. And then, then we'll, <coughs> excuse me, then for each project, because each project would be unique, we'll execute a, a project specific agreement that deals with roles, responsibility, the unique nature of basically constructing within the right of way uh, and, okay. and certain requirements that the Beltline will require that differ from the overarching agreement. So getting to the detail for each specific project. So basically that's covered and the next step in the process after we execute this agreement would be to, to, to begin the, the process of getting that overall arching master agreement with the Beltline as well as Project specific agreement. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Chairman, it's Roberta. Hey, Mr. I, I, Mr. Mr. How, how you doing? Go ahead, Roberta. I, I had a question and, and, and uh, Mr. Fryson uh, touched on it, but my question was, are we in this instance, uh, uh, Frank, are we treating uh, the Beltline as a, as a, a governmental entity? It's kind of difficult to hear you. Can you get up on your mic a little bit? They will be party to, to again, they will be party. They, they, the agreement for anything, it requires that anything within that right away, we have to, number one, execute a master agreement with, 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 uh, with, with the Beltline that requires a relationship to be established and, and detail roles and responsibilities with the Beltline. And again, going back, each project will require a project-based agreement, is what we call the PVA, where we will we'll get into more detail on basically some work within right away on that particular project. Well, I, I, I'm asking uh, because, and, and you can help me out with that, are we um, partnering with any other nonprofit organizations in such a fashion? We, excuse me. 
And I, I, will the but will the outfit be contributing financially? Mr. Long, this is Liz. I think as we envision the projects with, um, I mean, the agreements with the belt line, it would more likely be through the arm of the city that is um, involved, the official, you know, signatory to those agreements. Did, did that answer your question, uh, Roberta? Not really, but that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll we're do it. Here. We're, we're having a meeting. And I'm going I'm to say this. Liz, when you spoke, it, it, there was a lot of echo and background, so it kind of chopped up a little bit. So I, I know I wasn't able to hear every word that you said. If you could repeat what you said, just, just kind of educating the board about how it is that the Beltline Association uh, has to be involved in this intergovernmental agreement in light of the fact that some of the projects basically overlap on the Beltline. Right, so the, so the, project, the project level agreements would um, be, and you know, we haven't gotten to that point yet, but we envision that they would be with the um, arm of the Beltline that is affiliated with the city. So that is something that we still have to work through. But we will need a them because, as Frank said, they, for the transit component, we will be operating or, or you know, implementing a project within that right of way. Um, Liz, uh, would that also open up the possibility of some of the NPUs being partners as well? No. 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 As well. No, because they. They are, they're, they would not have the same standing as, as, as the owner of that right of way. Okay. This is, uh, this is Jeff Parker. My, you know, my understanding is, is that um, Atlanta Beltline Incorporated um, is, in a, is a economic development arm of the city of Atlanta with an independent, with, with, a, with a board. Um, Completely or largely controlled by the the mayor. It's and, it's, and that, it's a nonprofit organization, with a full board, a separate entity. There's there's two Beltline organizations. One is a nonprofit, um, and we I don't believe we would be entering into an agreement with them. We're, we're, we would be entering into an agreement with Atlanta Beltline Incorporated. Okay. Um, which is uh, the, the economic development arm and, and the owner of the, uh, you know, of the property where the, where the belt line is. And, and so in order to, for example, for us to build a light rail corridor or, or any transit corridor on their property, we will, we will need a, an easement. Um, and the, the Beltline, Atlanta Beltline Incorporated is the holder of that, you know, title of that property. So that easement would need to be granted through through them in an action of the uh, of ABI's board. Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, Mr. Chair, may I ask a question? This is Rita Scott. I'm Rita, go ahead. So in the interest in the incident of a conflict, would it be necessary to resolve that with the Beltline and the city of Atlanta? Or if you resolve it, if you had a conflict, you could resolve it. Atlanta would internally resolve it with the Beltline? Let me take a stab at that, if you would, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, so again, Board Member Scott, <clears throat> there will be a project specific agreement <clears throat> that hopefully that hopefully resolves <clears throat> excuse me. There will be a project specific agreement that uh, that will address the primary issues of construction within the right of way for that particular project which in the belt lines right of way. If we can't come to, to a resolution, it will be elevated up through the governance process where basically it will go through the governance committee 
If it still can't be resolved, it would go up to the subcommittee to take to the city. And basically, that will be discussion with the city's subcommittee. Ultimately, the responsibility as it pertains to a transit component is vested with the model board. And basically, that's where the final decision is. We can't come to an agreement at the sub tiers. We may. Frank, let me add that, you know, there will be some inherent um, things that, uh, as a property owner, um, Atlanta Beltline Incorporated will um, need to control it. And, and I'll make an analogy to when the heavy rail system was built, many pieces of that are on permanent easements to a railroad. And we will likely need to get the same um, sort of agreement. Um, I don't think we're contemplating that MARTA would take title to the, the slice of land where the transit is and the ABI retains title. Um, it's, it's likely that we would have a, you know, we would have a, a permanent easement. So, for example, um, you know, we would need to, uh, that, that, that easement and, and that, that agreement to do work on, uh, on that corridor, to maintain the corridor, to operate the corridor, to have sufficient liability insurance and, and all those types of things need to be incorporated um, into that agreement that, that ultimately, uh, you know, definitely the MARTA Board of Directors will, uh, will need to approve. And I believe uh, the, the, you know, from talking to, to Clyde over at the Beltline, um, you know, uh, that his board will also need to, need to approve that. So it's not completely because they're they're an independent arm of the city of Atlanta. They do have some fundamental control as that property owner that that we will have to uh, enter into a mutual agreement with them on. Okay, th thanks a lot, Jeff. So the bottom line is that as these projects are rolling out, there's going to be a specific project plan for each one of them, and any conflicts will be dealt with at that time. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments by the board about this briefing? Okay. If not, we're going to move on to the next point of business. I don't have that up in front of me. I didn't memorize it. So if you all could put that up again and I'll call it out. Okay. The next point of business is a resolution of the MARTA board of directors approving an IGA agreement with the city of Atlanta. Okay. It's, it's what we talked about. Okay. <laughs> for the development and implementation of the more moderate expansion program. So Mr. Rucker, you've explained what we're doing. Uh, now we need to go ahead and deal with the resolution. That's right, Mr. Chair. Okay, um, Okay. thank you, sir. And I re request that the consider an approval for this resolution. Mr. Chair, I move for approval, Al Pond. That was Mr. Floyd. Mr. Floyd moved for approval. Is there a second? That was Brother Chair, Rob Frierson second. Mr. Frierson seconds it. Any any discussion about this? Uh, it's essentially we're voting on what it is we discussed in the briefing. Any further discussion? Right. You know, I just want to put it on the record that, you know, I mean, it, it, and again, I pray that it's not significant, but the trajectory of financing and, and, and the tax base is supposed to support this. These projects uh, have been uh, tossed into turmoil by the events of the last eight weeks. I pray that over the next couple of years, everything kind of levels out and it's not a big deal. But uh, but but it's been represented to the board that, that this this project and plan is flexible and has the ability to basically adjust and modify according to what the uh, fiscal conditions are going forward. And with that, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to approve it. You know, I'm going to vote vote for it. Any other questions or comments before I call for the vote? Got a motion and second, didn't we? General Consulting and Professional Services uh, for the Department of Capital Programs uh, for the fiscal year upcoming 2021. Uh, Ms. Marcia Anderson Bomar, Assistant General Manager for Capital Program Delivery. 
We vote on that last. God, one. We have to vote on that last one. We didn't vote. We yeah. did vote. We we voted. Yeah, yeah I, I asked who votes no, who who abstains, and without that, then everybody else votes yes. Well, you you, you weren't ready to vote. I didn't hear any of that. I didn't hear anything like that. No. Right, well, I'll tell you what. Let me let me let me back it up because this is recorded. I'm gonna go back and do what we did before. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. There's no more discussion. Are there any people who abstain from this from this resolution voting in, 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 in for this revolu resolution? Point of clarification. Uh, go, go ahead, Ms. Ms. Oh, three. We're, we're dealing with number three, the first resolution. Correct. Again, what we heard before was the briefing. And now we're voting on what it is that we were briefed upon. So it's the is resolution that's right. is that two on the page? It's number three. Okay, thank you. Okay, and again, are there any abstentions? Okay, hearing none, are there any no votes to this resolution that has been moved and seconded? Okay, hearing no no's and abstentions, then this resolution is passed unanimously. Okay, so we're going to move on to number four. Again, it's a resolution authorizing the expenditure of capital funds for general consult. Yeah, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> um, good morning, Madam Chair, Dr. Edmund, board members, Mr. Parker, Mr. Rucker. Uh, I'm here this morning uh, to ask you for approval of a resolution to uh, authorize $2.5 million dollars uh, for uh, expenditure for professional services and specialized vendors uh, utilizing the GSA Schedule 70 to support the capital improvement program. We are working diligently to reduce our, our reliance <laughs> on this vehicle. Uh, and as you recall, uh, in the past several months, you have uh, um, approved us uh, doing several procurements that will allow us to fill some of those positions. Uh, but as we uh, need some time to work through those procurements, uh, we are anxious to retain the subject matter experts uh, that we have uh, assisting us with key projects such as the train control and, and SCADA upgrade, the uh, tunnel ventilation system rehab, rail stabilization, and other highly technical uh, projects. And so to be able to do that, we are requesting uh, that you uh, approve the resolution for um, funding of two and a half million dollars for GCPS contracts for fiscal year 21. Dr. Edmund, if you are talking, we cannot hear you. While we, while we wait for Dr. Edmund, um, I'd be happy to entertain any questions if you have any. Let me, while I'm, I'll move approval. I'll second. This is Frida. I'll second. Okay, now discussion. Ms. Bomar, this is Roberta. I do have one, one question. Uh, it's yes, just for me and, and, and the map. Um, but it, the chart is showing um, that we had a a balance left over, I'm assuming, of a million uh, two hundred ten. Uh, will that be uh, go towards the twenty five, the two two million five hundred, or is that two million five hundred brand new funds? Is we showing a balance? Uh, is, yes. So the the balance that's showing is um, there is always a lag between when work is performed and when we're invoiced and when the invoice gets paid. Yes, ma'am. Some, some of those some of those one point two million dollars will be extended by June thirtieth. Thank the you. Two and a half million, yeah, the two and a half million dollars would be all new funding. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Frida, have we lost Dr. Edmund? 
he doesn't show up on online. And sorry, the chief's still on. He's showing up as being on. I cannot um, hear him. Maybe give him a call. If you will hold a moment, we can try and reach him by phone. Number. Board members, I just spoke with. Anyone hear me? Yes, ma'am. He is having technical difficulties. He's going to try to loop back in, but in the meantime, he asked if Mr. Griffin will finish out the meeting, and his vote is a yes. I will. Is there any more discussion on this resolution? If not, does anybody abstain? Anybody opposed? And the resolution passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Are there other matters to come before this committee? If not, we stand adjourned and we'll go into the operations and safety committee meeting shortly. Okay. Let me call the Operations and Safety Committee meeting to order. Would you call the roll, Rebby? Yes, sir. Roberta Abdul Salam. Present. Robert. Jim Durrett. Roderick Edelman. Present. William Floyd. Roderick Frierson. Present. Ryan Glover. Mr. Griffin, we have you. Present. Rita Hardage. Rita Hardage. Present. Alicia Ivey. Russell McMurray, John Pond, Russell McMurray, He's unmuting. Russell McMurray, I count him as present. He's here. Rita Scott, present. Christopher Tomlinson. Present. Thomas Worthy. All right. We have a quorum. Did I get we have 10 board members on the line. 10 board members. Can I get approval of the April 30th, 2020 Operation and Safety Committee meeting. Minutes. Mr. Frieda Hardage, I approve. I price and second. Okay, we've got a motion and second. Is does anybody abstain? Does anybody object? If not, the minutes are approved. First order of business. Oh, we got some new blood. Uh, resolution authorizing the expenditure of capital funds for general consulting and professional services, GCPS, for the Department of Safety and Quality Assurance, Police, and Information Security in fiscal year 2120. Lieutenant Gregory Gamble. <laughs> Lieutenant Gamble, you're on. Thank you. Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Parker, Mr. Greenwood, and members of the Operations and Safety Committee. Um, can I take over this presentation so I can show the slides, Kirk? Yes, you should have it now. Yeah. What? Oh, hold on. Okay. You should have it now. 
Yes, I do. There we go. All right. Okay. May I direct your attention to agenda items two, three, and four? Um, let's begin with item number two. Um, we are requesting the continuance of this general consult contracted professional services for FY21. Um, GCPS contract staff is necessary to implement MARTA's departments of police, cyber enterprise, and safety and quality insurance to support projects identified in the capital improvement program. These capital projects require highly experienced staff with specialized expertise in the areas of planning, design, implementation, training, and documentation, support the development and mature security initiatives, and maintain adequate levels of daily system security and emergency management protocols in accordance with federal regulations. A good example of how we use GCPS is for system security, our video pullers, um, a group that pulls all requested videos for investigations, complaints, or commendations while maintaining the chain of custody. Each request initiates a cascade of steps to retrieve video that typically must be filled within 24 hours. Um, the video is received by 6 p.m. The security techs receive those video requests then they go and locate the bus at the various different garages. They locate the car that's on the bus. They remove the hard drive, insert their USB. Then they begin the uh, monitor progress of uploading the video. Once that video is completed, it's contaminated. Upload that video to a classified drive. Then they notify the requester that the job is complete. Uh, the total video pulls for calendar year 2018 was 7,907. In calendar year 2019, it was 8,274 videos that they have pulled. With that being said, for police, cyber enterprise, safety, and quality insurance, we are requesting for FY21 a budget of $4,260,000. It's broken down by police, $2.1 million, cyber enterprise, $1.8 million. Safety and quality insurance, 360,000. Historical data, um, for FY20, we budgeted for 3 million. Uh, after April 30 of 2020, we have spent 1,079,332.96 for uh, FY19, we budgeted for 3 million and we spent 2 million, $77,394. Any questions before I transition over to Dean Malice? This is a rock Harrison. Um, Brother Chair, I have a question. So, hey, my problem. Yeah, so, so the pools. So, from what I'm hearing, you there have been 7,900 requests to pull video from all different sources. Is that correct? Yes. And so, we've spent the time to pull the video. Are we compensating it all for the, for the, for the, the time that we spend doing that? Are you saying for the people who are requesting the videos from yeah. out stakeholders? Yeah. That would be a question for legal that we have to answer. Yes, if I may, this is Liz. Um, if, if we supply a video um, in response to an open records request, um, we do charge for um, the time needed and, and pursuant to the, the charges that are allowed to be made under the open records act so we do receive some of that um those funds expended back okay okay I, I i think that's quite a bit but i didn't realize it was that volume all right thank you mr chair i have a question okay go ahead when i look at the one million seventy nine for eight as of april 30th do we have a amount of videos pulled in coordinates with that dollar figure? We do, but at this time, I did not bring that um, information, but I'd be happy to, happily to supply that information afterwards. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I've got a question. Yes, sir, Ms. Pond. Uh, Lieutenant Gamble, you're, you're tracking right at uh, a little over a million dollars for this year with a month to go and then you're requesting two million that's a pretty large increase i'm just curious uh, what's driving that increase 
I took over the unit uh, in July of 2019. Um, and at that time, I was trying to get caught up to speed. Then within two months, we had a lot of transition that took place. During that transition, we still had vacancies that was not filled during that time. Um, so as of February, we are back up to full speed. So with that being said, with those positions being vacant for months at a time, that's the reason why you see the 1 million. But when you look at the historical of FY19, we spent 2 million. So basically I use that 2.1 million based on the historical F119, which is a, a better uh, relationship to FY21. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant, you might explain too that while our cameras are live and can be monitored from, from headquarters, but the, the hard drive is actually physically located on the buses, on, on buses. And, and in order to maintain the chain of custody or something, you have to download it from the hard drive. Is that correct? Correct. And so basically with chain of custody, once that video requests come in, we have these security technicians that go out to the and so the thing is, they have to locate that bus. So let's say they look for bus 32. What's going and on? And it's still on his route. We have to wait for that bus to come into that facility to be able to get into that bus and pull that hard drive. And once we, once we begin that hard drive, that's the chain of custody. Hold on a second, Luke. Somebody's mic needs to be muted. We got some kids on here. Okay, Lieutenant, go ahead. Okay, so the chain of custody starts when that bus leaves and it's begin to record that if whatever's going on. Once that security technician, that supervisor received the request and disseminate that to the security techs and they get on the bus, that chain of custody is really, really important because that's why we pull it from the hard drive and they're uploaded to a classified drive, whereas we have security parameters of that drive. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. so we physically go down and chase out on a bus. So that, yes. adds the, that adds to it. Okay, yes. any other questions? From Lieutenant Gamble. Mr. Chairman, if I may, it's Roberta. Roberta. Um, just in my mind, I'm trying to imagine, Lieutenant, um, how long would that, um, uh, footage be available on the bus's computer. Does it ever transfer over to a mainframe or what they used to call it back in the day anyway? Uh, say, for instance, you get a request and if something occurred on the bus 15 days ago, would that footage still be on the bus computer or will it be looped someplace else by that point? No, man, we, we would lose it. And since we have so many cameras and video, uh, it would be um, difficult to have that much storage to okay. save all that video of amongst all of our buses, trains, and um, other CCTV footages. But that's why we go and put it from the hard drive. Okay. All right. And we Thank you. With the twenty four seven for Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, right. Lieutenant, um, does, do our cameras and videos tie in with the Atlanta Police VIC? Well, that's that's a great question because we are in the process. We just signed the um, the MOU again with City of Atlanta. So the answer to your question at this time is no. But we are about to uh, restart that up. We used to, but when the City of Atlanta got hacked uh, for security reasons, we had stopped that. But City of Atlanta has a new technology force that's over there, and so now we're about to start that back up again once City of Atlanta signs off. They initiated, our groups have signed off on it. So we just wait for the city of Atlanta to sign their documents. So they might sign off within a day or two, then they will be looking at the videos again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question, Tom. Anything else? Any other questions? I hear a motion to approve. Worthy moves. Worthy moves. Party second. Party second. Any discussion? Any more discussion? Does anybody object? Does anybody abstain? 
Motion's approved. Lieutenant. Okay, and I was going to transition over to Dean Malice and safety. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Parker, members of the Operations Safety Committee meeting to piggyback off of what Lieutenant Campbell was uh, requesting in terms of GCPS support contractors for uh, FY21. I'm requesting 1.8 million to support the current contractors that are in place. The goal for FY20 is to eventually FY21 is to eventually phase out all those GCPS contractors and replace them with FTEs uh, for FY20. For FY20, the reason for the um, discrepancy in terms of the larger amount is I did not backfill uh, four of the positions that were requested, uh, move, trying to move forward in replacing those GCPS contractors with uh, full-time employees. Okay. Any questions? Uh, Diane, let's see, that's resolution which? Which one are we on now? That's tied with um, Lieutenant Gamble's. Uh, I think that was resolution number two. Is that correct, Lieutenant? Okay, yes. so that's both up. Mr. Chairman, this is Liz, if I may, that um, all three of the um, GCPS requests for police for um, Dean's area as well as safety were included in that one resolution. So technically you've already approved. Technically we've approved the resolution. Yes. Correct. Well, uh, Dean just explained here. So is there any questions on Dean's part? Now we're down to resolution uh, number four. Does anybody have any questions on that? Or does somebody, Lieutenant, you need to explain that one. No. Okay. All right. Then, Lieutenant, you did real well on your first appearance here. Congratulations. Uh, thank, you. thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Taylor, we've got a resolution authorizing the award of a contract for the procurement of four 60 foot 60 uh, articulated GNC G46638. Good. Good morning, Ms. Griffin, Mr. Parker, members of the Operations and Safety Committee. Uh, may I direct your attention to agenda item number five, requesting resolution authorizing award of a contract for procurement of four new flyer CNG 60 foot articulated buses, uh, contract number B4663. Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry to interrupt, but the slides are not progressing. We're still showing Mr. Lieutenant Campbell. Campbell. Okay. Um, actually, I'm bring that up. I had um, agendas two, three, and four. Okay. Okay, now bring up. Uh, Mr. Chairman, again, this is Liz. I think what um, the resolution number four that was not approved is for the um, police uniforms. Okay. Item. All right, so the procurement of the, let's go back to resolution number four then, Mr. Taylor, hold up. Sure. And authorizing the rejection of bids received for the procurement of um, uh, MPD uniforms and equipment IFB B4552. Lieutenant Gamble, you got one more. Well, actually I have the CAD system as well, sir. That was um, agenda number three. Okay. That was part of the slide story. Is that okay to go back to agenda number two? Back. I thought they said we approved that. Okay. That was for number two. Um, okay, GC's let's three then. I'm sorry. No problem. Kirk, can you go back, please? Number three. Lieutenant Gamble, do you need presentation? Um, yes. Okay, let me make you presenter just a second. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry. I it's hard to work in this situation. Okay. Coming up. Okay. Um, we are requesting approval for solicitation via RFP for replacement of the Compute Aid Dispatch slash record management system. Um, Compute Aid Dispatch used by law enforcement and emergency preparedness agencies forms the heart of incident response and communication capabilities. Cab functions include call taking, location, location verification, dispatching, unit status, resource allocation, and call disposition. Information collected during response activities 
automatically is transferred from CAD to a records management system. Any updates made by CAD operators or field personnel also automatically are archived in the RMS databases and entered into predefined reports. Per federal mandate, the RMS routinely formats and directly submits the latter to the FBI National Incident Based Reporting System. I replaced the current system, Payment System CAD. Uh, software has been in service since 1995 and is outdated. Officer incident and action reports are handwritten and manually circulated. Yes, we do still handwrite all of our reports. Uh, it's an absolute time consuming process that takes the officer out of service for an extended period of time. Additionally, additionally, there are no real time analytical functions to track crime trends. Payment system has exceeded its utility, noting more than 50 outages throughout county year 2019, one loss of service episode on average every 67.2 hours. The mean time to report of 70 minutes. The manufacturers terminated support December 31st, 2021. MPD will require a new vendor to submit bids that will move our current CAS system to paperless report writing and our RMS system to analytical, analytical data retrieval for, all, for our department to track and report crime real time. The new RMS system also will allow our criminal investigators investigation unit to document, track, and report all of its investigations to internal and external stakeholders for prosecution. The total um, costs, as you see down there, where you see annual support first year, then right below that is the total system costs for three years, including the first year of the annual support. Uh, it's four million three hundred fifty thousand dollars and thirty three hundred ninety seven dollars. With that annual support, we will include um, training, but also um, technology updates, and we will ensure we have uh, growth opportunities uh, with the project um, with the CAD system. We don't want to purchase it then outgrow it when we get it. We want to make sure we have growth opportunities, and that will be included in the annual support um, every year. Any questions? Question to Lieutenant Gamble. If not, could I get a motion to approve and then we'll discuss? So moved. Uh, Second. Moved? Roberta. Okay, Roberta moved. Second. Second. All right, Alphonse second. Uh, now in discussion. I think that's pretty straightforward. I can't believe that we're still doing all our reports by hand. Uh, Anybody, anybody object to the resolution? Does anybody abstain? If not, it's approved unanimously. Okay, Lieutenant. Last one. Um, we are requesting to recancel the solicitation for police uniforms and equipment and to initiate the rebate process. Initially, four responses received to the IFB. Two vendors did not supply pricing on all required items. The lowest bidder was DB non compliant. The immediate requirement for police uniforms and equipment is addressed through alternate means, extension of an existing contract. Endorsement will allow a rebid process, DBE compliance, possible multiple vendor awards, and future cost savings to the authority. Any questions? All right, the motion is to approve the, the previous bids and bid it again. Correct. Any discussion? Do I hear a motion to approve? This is free to I, I move to approve. Roberta, I second. Roberta, second. We got a motion and second. Now then, is there any discussion? <laughs> if not, anybody object? Anybody abstains? Approved unanimously. <laughs> Batting a thousand, Lieutenant. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right. Now that clears. Yes. Okay, now we move on. Uh, back to the agenda. Let me find the agenda again. Uh, it all out. Okay, uh, the next item. Now back to Mr. Taylor in his foot buses. Yes, sir. I'm I'm back. Uh, Kurt, if you would, you can go ahead and, and post that presentation if you don't mind. I do not have your presentation, William. Um, I have. Do I have the ability to share my screen? Yes, 
I'll make you presenter. Give me just a second. All right, you now have presenter privileges. All right, um, everybody should have that momentarily. Okay, we got it. All right, so I'll proceed. Um, the requested resolution for contract um, B46638 authorizes the general manager and CEO or his delegate to enter into a contract for procurement of four new flyer 60 foot CNG articulated buses with new flyer industries and the amount of $4,457,492.44. This is a firm fixed, yes. Your presentation is obscured. We're not seeing your presentation. We're seeing, uh, yep. there we go, that's it. All right. Okay. Let me see here. Let me make an adjustment. All right. Um, all right. This is a firm fixed unit price contract. 80% of this contract is funded by the FTA, and a 20% of this contract will be funded by. Uh, local capital funds. I'll proceed through the uh, presentation. Uh, <clears throat> this is a competitive grant award from the FTA for articulated buses. Um, the grant specifically addresses uh, heavy ridership, heavy ridership, along with um, uh, near zero NOx uh, CNG engines in these vehicles giving us the latest, greatest technology, reducing emissions uh, from these engines while in service. The benefits uh, for these articulated buses certainly are the high passenger loads. Um, these buses also have the turning radius of a 35 to 40 foot bus. Uh, certainly with that higher capacity, uh, we could support any special event, bus bridges, and certainly um, with social distancing in place on our buses right now, these buses certainly accommodate more passengers, uh, helping us really improve our customer service in that area. These buses have been a hit with our community. We have 18 articulated buses currently in our fleet. That's about 3% of our fleet size. And these will be a welcome uh, site to soar eyes uh, for our community, therefore uh, improving our brand as well. Uh, our current fleet uh, is performing at exceptionally well. We put these buses in service around 2016-17, and we are currently life to date uh, at 24,000 miles between failure. So uh, uh, that is a pretty good uh, uh, mean distance between failure performance matrix, and, and we're proud of that. Um, again, these buses uh, versus past articulated buses are much, much more improved, especially uh, as it relates to drivability characteristics, uh, having better control of their, the rear end of that vehicle um, during wet conditions especially. Mr. Taylor, what constitutes a failure? Well, uh, any defect uh, reported by that operator okay. uh, while the bus is in service. Okay. That could be the door didn't open right. Or, it could or, be the door, it could be the headlight out, it can be that they report. Okay. All right, and uh, I mentioned earlier that FTA funded at 80% and the FTA awarded us $3.6 million toward the project. Uh, our investment from Marta's perspective is $857,492. Uh, $857, and that brings this total project to an amount of uh, $4,457,492. 
Training aids will also be included in this uh, procurement. And um, with that, uh, there are no DBE goals assigned to this particular project. So diversity and inclusion did not assign a goal for um, because the transit vehicle manufacturers are established directly um, by the FTA. Are there any questions um, for this particular project? I yeah. get a motion that we accept that the government's for $3,600,000. So move by Rod Frierson. Second, Al Pond. Second, Mr. Pond. Discussion. I, uh, Mr. Chair, I have a question. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Scott. You mentioned that currently we have this particular bus. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I missed that question. You were breaking up. Um, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? You mentioned that currently we have eight particular buses in use in the fleet because of the current pandemic situations and you mentioned how it would be advantageous based upon what we're going through. We're all 18 in use during this pandemic. Do you know? Uh, pretty much all 18 are in use uh, uh, if they're uh, serviceable. So the answer to that question is yes. Um, we are pretty much maxed out using every bus in our fleet to accommodate social distancing right now. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Floyd. Yes, sir, Mr. Floyd. Could this uh, be considered a COVID related expense and reimbursable under the CARES Act funds? And the second question is what happened to our electric buses? Where? Okay, so um, I will have to ref reference legal for uh, COVID related funds. Uh, right now, this is funded by local capital funds. I don't know if we could take advantage of COVID related funds at this point. We also, th this is Liz, this is, we are also um, having this funded by grant funds. Is that correct, William? Yes, 3.6 million. Yeah. This is uh, this is Jeff Parker. Sorry, I was I was on mute trying to answer. Um, I don't. I the CARES Act money, the two hundred ninety eight million that that we're uh, we're getting, we're not able to use that for um, local match uh, for an FTA project. Um, we could we you know we can use it for other things. We have we have a tremendous amount of flexibility with that. Um, you know there are some restrictions, but um, you know, we are able to, to, to move money around because of that flexibility. So it's, um, you know, it, it really isn't impacting us, um, in order, you know, to maximize the flexibility because we can't use this for match dollars. Okay. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? Um, she had one. Yes, go ahead. She had one other question, Mr. Griffin. Uh, what was that one? Oh, yeah. What about electric buses? Electric buses, that's right. So electric buses um, at the earliest will be on the June calendar at the latest will be on the July calendar for approval. Uh, so we are still progressing with that. Um, we're just getting some um, supporting um requisitions in place with some of the contractors that will be working with us on this project so it is still progressing okay does any does anyone know is that a hundred percent uh uh fta program or is it an 80 20. i i just don't recall off the top of my head the electric bus yeah the electric bus grant i thought it was a hundred percent Thank you for remember that. That's right. We'll, when we bring it to the board, we'll 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 let folks know All about right. that.
Is there any more discussion on this this resolution? Anybody object to this resolution? Does anybody abstain? And the resolution passes unanimously. By the budget, Mr. Taylor. Thank you very much, sir. Well, as soon as it gets to the board. All right. Uh, All right. Peter Bruno, Acting Director of Mobility. How about a briefing on mobility? Sure. Uh, Kirk, can you allow me to share my screen? Yes, I am swapping now. You should have it now. Can everybody see my screen? I do. Okay. Uh, good morning, Chairman Griffin, members of the Operations Committee. Uh, Mr. Parker, I'm here to uh, present an overview of uh, the mobility program at MARTA. The mobility program at MARTA is unique in that the majority of work is outsourced. Therefore, our business processes are aligned to ensure compliance with contracts and delivery of MARTA's mission um, for this program, mobility. Three key business processes define the management of mobility. Reporting and performance tracking, oversight of contractors, and continual improvement. Briefly, the mobility program is organized in this manner. The director reports up to the deputy, deputy chief of bus operations, who reports up to the chief of bus operations, then supporting the director are MARTA employees in three key functional areas. You've got the operations and maintenance oversight team, uh, you've got reservation, and then the eligibility group. Then the, the three contracts we have in place in turn support the MARTA functions. MV and GTS currently support the operations and maintenance of mobility, provide that service hire the operators, so forth, maintain MARTA's assets. And then MTM provides the functional assessment under the eligibility program, which is located in the annex of the Travel Training Center. Just a brief update on our three contracts in place. Uh, the first one, the MV Operations and Maintenance Contract, was executed back in March of 2016. Uh, the MARTA Board of Directors exercised that second and final option year in February of 2020. This contract has an expiration date um, of, of March 2021. The MTM functional assessment contract was executed in May of 2016. Uh, the second option year was exercised and that expires in May of 2021. So those first two, we are now in the process of um, deciding on the best path forward and so forth. So they are new contracts are in place by the expiration next year. And then finally, the supplemental operations and maintenance contract was awarded to GTS last May 2019. And GTS um, achieved full notice to proceed in, on April 1st of 2021. That contract has another three years on it. It expires in May of 2023. <clears throat> GTS, um, as an aside, operates about 126,000 hours each year. That's, a, that's roughly about 30% of the work. Moving back to the business processes, reporting and performance tracking. This is a key element of how we manage the MARTA Mobility Program. We want to be sure that we would do this in a smart manner and are not just looking at data for data's sake. In the upper right corner of your screen, you'll note uh, one of the tools we use, Kirk Talbot and his team set up a, a platform um, uh, in the Microsoft world, uh, Power BI, which in this case here, as you can see, allows us to monitor trips in real time. This is a snapshot from May 13th. We can go on any web-based device and immediately look at the number of trips for the day, the number of trips late, and the current running of on-time performance. You also see there's, there's detail. We can click on an individual trip and see where it is. It's very powerful in giving the MARTA oversight team 
insight to how our contractors are performing. In the lower right are our SharePoint sites, which we use quite often. Moving to the left side of the screen, we've got our periodic performance tracking method on a monthly and on a weekly basis. Every, every week, um, around 1 or 2 o'clock on a Monday, we send the prior week report uh, to the Deputy Chief of Bus Operations. And then every month we prepare a monthly KPI report. This really is, is intended to keep all of us on the same page relative to where how our contractors are performing. But the important thing is we're increasing the accessibility to data and simplifying the process. Moving now to the second business process is oversight of our contractors. One key element was there was in late February, early March, the trapeze system, which is the backbone of how mobility is operated, was transferred from our contractor at MV back to the authority. This, this was a key move as it put MARTA back in the driver's seat relative to the data and how the system is functioning. As an aside, the trapeze system supports many key elements eligibility, reservation, scheduling, dispatch, and reporting platform. We've also reconfigured the, the MARTA contractor meeting content and frequency to be more productive and relevant. We've also done an analysis of all the various reports that we were expecting from our contractors, and we simplified them, we eliminated some redundancy and duplication. Two key technical elements we rolled out were SharePoint sites for our contractors, they're required on a frequent basis to upload reports as we request. And then we've also developed a contractor compliance tool, which is an inventory of all the various terms and conditions in the contract. Our MARTA oversight team uses this tool to be sure that all the elements in the contract are in compliance and being abided by on a pass-fail scoring basis. Any items that appear to be in a fail status then we immediately work with our partners at contracts to procurement. We go through a corrective action measure, and we simply return that contract term back to compliance. Turning now to the last of our important business processes is continual improvement. One key element of that, and I know it was one of Tom Young's last briefings, was about the town hall meeting we had in October of 2019. There was a couple of key items that came out of that that we've continued to work on. One of them was the communication, primarily the onboard communication of the vehicles over air. Some of the speakers at the town hall commented about the disposition of, of the dispatchers toward the operators and so forth toward the customers. So what, we, what we're looking at there now is, is a handset device that will allow for over-air communication when that's appropriate, but will also allow for operators to pick up the handset and have that conversation with dispatch or others on the operation side of things. Another item that came up during a town hall meeting that we've worked very hard on is the amount of time um, for folks to, to get certified or do their recertification. There is a 21-day requirement uh, from FTA and uh, Roosevelt Stripling and his team have been working very hard to reduce that. Now I can say that we've, we've reduced that time uh, quite a bit. Some of the other things that we're looking at in continued improvement is really engaging in the why around KPI trend analysis, not simply accepting the data, but trying to get beneath the data, doing root cause analysis. We're also looking at the unconditional certification program these are individuals we know are going to be using the mobility service for quite some time. How can we streamline that for our customers and make it easier? One of the most important elements is protecting MARTA's assets. MARTA, as you know, owns the facilities and the vehicles through which the mobility program is operated. We've entrusted these to our contractors, but on the other hand, through FTA State of Good Repair, MAP 21, elements, MARTA is required to maintain these assets. So that's an important aspect of what we do. We're also looking at developing a reservations eligibility team cross-training plan, whereas needs arise on the eligibility side, there's a 
there's a backlog or quite a, um, a supply of certifications, we can redeploy reservation agents to help clear that backlog without having to go to finance for additional workers and so forth. And this will also add more continuity to the program. And then the other item I know we've talked about quite a bit is, is the RFP operations model. Currently, executive leadership is evaluating the, the best path forward for the authority. But the bottom line here is always asking, how can we do better for our customers that use mobility? Something I know we spent an, also a lot of time talking about is COVID-19 health safety measures. The authority's done a great job putting practices in place that keep our customers and our employees safe. Some of the specific things we've done at Mobility um, are the same. We were doing door-to-door -door service as a practice for our customers. Talking to the MAC committee uh, early on in the early part of March, mid-March timeframe, we came to the conclusion together that it might be worthwhile to suspend door-to-door -door service for the time being in order to protect our employees and customers. So we've done that. And at the appropriate time, we'll think about re reinstating that. We've also suspended the requirement for in-person interview and functional assessment for new and recertifying mobility applicants. In order to cover them, we've automatically given a six-month extension for any recertifying applicants. What, what this, this began in early part of April. So what we'll do is come back in a September time frame and then get those folks scheduled in based on the um, health safety protocols and authority. The other thing that we did is we limited passengers to two on our vehicles for safe distancing. I know on fixed routes, they've implemented some safe distancing measures. This is how mobility responded. So it's limited to two passengers or a combination customer and a PCA. This, this has been met with great results from our customers. They do appreciate it, and we've changed our scheduling and logarithm to take care of this. One thing we're doing is we're utilizing the FA Suite work system in order to flag the COVID-19 cleaning protocols to ensure our contractors are disinfecting and cleaning the vehicles on the timely manner that we expect. So both at GTS and MV, the FA Suite work orders will pop up, It'll say, hey, it's time to disinfect the vehicles, and they'll do it. So this helps us keep track of that, also to monitor whether it was done or not. If a cleaning protocol wasn't closed out, then we immediately take corrective action. And finally, again, Kirk Talbot and his team helped us establish remote work arrangements for all of our reservation agents. They, are, they were at Brady, 16 of them. So when the authority began to move toward um, toward a situation where employees could telework, we uh, developed a soft phone laptop system for a reservation agents to take those calls from home. And they have been. And I, I will say, although trip and reservations calls have reduced, we have maintained a 6% call in queue. Um, so our productivity continues uh, to be where it was prior to, to COVID-19. But before I close today, I just want to briefly go over three key performance indicators of fiscal year to date. This first one is on-time performance. As you can see, our trend line for our contractors is increasing upward. I would say notably that in the March and April timeframe, traffic in Atlanta did decrease significantly and our on-time performance has gone up. But prior to that, we were consistently tracking in in the 93-94 range, and we expect that to continue. These next two slides will clearly indicate to the board committee members the impact of the governor's shelter in place, some of the assisted living and senior homes um, restrictions on leaving, so forth, has affected our revenue hours. As you can see in February, that's a relatively normal revenue hour metric, 47,000 roughly. In March, as folks begin to shelter in place, and the governor issued their order, then we dropped down to 35. And as you can see, generally the revenue hours just dropped off the table. So we're at roughly about 20,000. And then trips. 
which is a complement to the revenue hours. Again, 65,000 trips in February, that's, that's, that's a normal. Then you can see that downward slide, 46,000 in March. And then in April, we ended at 22,000 trips, which is probably one of the lowest trip um, measures I think mobility has ever seen. So I will say that in May, we are beginning to see a slight tick upward, not too, too dramatic, but it looks like the trend is uh, moving up. This concludes my presentation for today. I'll have to be happy to entertain any questions you may have. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Al Potter, a quick question. Go ahead. Uh, that was a, he had a good report. Uh, my question goes back to uh, prior COVID-19, uh, when things were fairly stable, the contract performance, the performance metrics you have versus the contractual requirements, you initiate these reports, you get that back. But uh, what are the uh, what are the recourses there when we're not meeting those criteria per our contract? Typically, what we typically what we've done and um, what we've done in the past and will continue to do is. If, if, if we see that a contract requirement is, is not being followed, we'll, we'll of course monitor that uh, for a week or so. But then what we would typically do is, you know, we'll circle up with Jacqueline Holland um, and contract firm. But we'll typically work with the contractor to come up with a 30-day 30, 30 corrective action plan. And that 30-day corrective action plan is going to have a couple of things. It's going to have a timeline to get that item back into compliance. It's also going to have clear and defined actions that the contractor will take in order to get that back in compliance. And then that becomes the commitment that is, that is made together between MARTA and the contractor. Now, after 30 days, if, if that still is not in compliance, then that's when we will circle back with Jacqueline Holland and her team and possibly look at a cure notice for that, and that's a more formal, um, I'd say, ratcheting up. But that's typically the steps we take. But because we meet with our contractors every other week and we talk about performance data, then the intent is not to get to that 30-day. The intent is to jump on things as soon as they look like um, they're trending. Down. And that's the role of the oversight team, so to look at that data every day and just be aware of, of where we are. Thank uh, you. This, this is Jeff Parker. Can I just add to that? And, and, and Liz can maybe provide some more details, but there are some, some performance metrics that do have liquidated damages associated with them. Is that correct, Liz? Yes, On this, there uh, are. These no. Contracts? Yeah, no, there are. In fact, the contract was has been revised to um, clarify those situations and, and the liquidated damages um, provisions. Yeah, so, so I believe like mean, mean distance between uh, failures uh, is, is one of them and, and uh, some of the other performance metrics are, you know, enforceable through liquidated damages. Correct. Mr. Chairman? Yes, ma'am, Roberta. Thank you. Um, Peter, thank you for a, a, a thoroughly uh, comprehensive um, report. Uh, and I, I really have one question uh, that goes back to um, when um, mobility began the, the suspended door-to-door uh, -door service. And my question or my concern is wh where do people, um, you know, get the, get the bus if, if they're not going door-to-door? How, you know, is there a distance or are you making it on a case by case determination? Well, we, we still still provide curb to curb. Curb to curb mm -hmm. is the ADA F, FTA mandated. So we'll we'll come up to their curb or their apartment building, pick them up there and drop them off. The door to door um, was an enhanced uh, practice that we were doing where the operator would actually, you know, safeguard the vehicle lock it up, but then would, would possibly go to the door of the residence and then help that individual from the door onto the vehicle. 
Okay. But, but we are, you know, we are complying with the law and the law, um, you know, requires that uh, coming, coming onto the, you know, onto the curb in front of the property, um, typically if it's a home right in front of the front door, and that the uh, the patron is required to uh, get themselves out of the house and uh, onto the curbside, and then we would we would give assistance if required to to uh, enter the vehicle either up the stairs or, or through the lift. Yes, that that's correct. Okay. I had to clear that up. I was wondering about that. Any other questions, Ms. Scott? Ms. Scott, would you speak into your microphone? Ms. Scott, speak into your microphone. Your microphone. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Hear me now. Yes. Yes. Hi. Yes. Do you know whether, uh, when looking at your slide under oversight of contractors, do you know whether or not there have been any permanent layoffs of drivers? There, there, there has not been any permanent layoffs. Um, MV uh, did furlough um, a number of drivers. Um, in the uh, third week of March, when uh, the governor's shelter in place uh, was issued and the trips dramatically declined. However, they are now, as we speak last week and this week, beginning to onboard those employees back um, as the trips begin to, to tick upward, but they were furloughed um, because we all know, and you know, we're looking forward to that day, um, when things get back above, you know, the 46,000 trips again. Just as, a, just as an aside, can I just add that, that all those four load employees were uh, offered uh, uh, an opportunity to do cleaning work at, at MARTA and uh, a small percentage of them uh, took, took MV up on, on that offer to keep them working. Okay, so that furlough period. that's why my question was, was permanent or furloughs? So if it was furloughed, that's then permanent. Thank you. It, sure. All right. Anything else? Any other questions? Comment? Not, Bruno, thank you for that uh, excellent report. Uh, okay. Are there other matters to come before this committee? Call your attention to you have the KPIs uh, included with this report. Let me ask staff. I try to. I do most of my stuff on my iPad, and the way that report is sent out, some sheets go one way, some sheets go another way, and on an iPad, it's very difficult to read those reports. Can we put all of them in the same order so that you can read that report, read the KPIs? We'll make sure that that, that that happens going forward. Is there any other business now to come before this committee? If not, we stand adjourned. I appreciate it, Mr. Griffin. Uh, if, uh, if we can, can we just go right on into the business management committee? Are we ready? Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to call this the Business Management Committee meeting to order. Uh, Rebbie, can you do a roll call? Yes, sir. Uh, Roberta Abdul Salam. Present. Robert Ash. Jim Durrett. Roderick Edmond. William Floyd. Roderick Frierson. Present. Ryan Glover. Jerry Griffin. Present. Rita Hardich. Present. Alicia Ivey. Russell McMurray. John Alpine. Present. 
Rita Scott. Present. Christopher Thomason. Present. Thomas Worthy. Present. Dr. Edmund. Roderick Edmund. I've recorded nine board members as present. Okay, we have a quorum. I'd like to call the um, uh, you know, uh, your um, attention to the agenda before you. Uh, the first item is a consent agenda, which has three items on it. I'd like to give a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented to the uh, committee. It's free to heart attack. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay. Second. Second. Second by who? No, upon. Alpine moved and seconded. Uh, do we have any questions concerning the consent agenda? Okay, hearing none, uh, I'd like to take a vote on the consent agenda. Are there any uh, oppositions to the consent agenda? Hearing none, are there any abstentions to the consent agenda? Hearing none, the motion carried for the consent agenda. All right, so the first item on the agenda. The individual agenda is a resolution authorizing the modification of in a contractual authorization for automation background screening uh, RFP C41453. Steve McClure, Director of Human Resources. Mr. McClure, are you on? Good morning, Mr. Chair. This is Stephen McClure. Okay. Uh, good morning, Mrs. Chair, uh, Mr. Parker, and the other board members. I'm here to present the resolution authorizing modification and contractual authorization for automation of background screens, contract P41453. Specifically, we're seeking approval to authorize the general manager or and CEO or his delegate to increase the contract value for the automation of background screens with first choice background screening company in the amount of $100,000. This procurement is paid 100% through local funding, local operating funds uh, that are approved in the 2020 budget. Uh, we are currently in an existing contract with first choice background screens. Uh, the contract began in October of 2018. At that time, we did not anticipate nor contemplate uh, the amount of background screens we would need to do for the Year of the Bus initiative. Nor did we contemplate addition of a la carte fees and third party fees that would be charged to us by uh, the background screening agency. The original contract amount was for $184,187 uh, in October of 2018. We had to increase that contract and go to the board for this um, in December of 2019 to $199,999. To date, as of May, uh, we have already expended $151,254, uh, which is uh, approximately 75% of the spend. Um, we're asking for this $100,000 uh, to ensure that we have enough money to carry us through the end of this contract year, which would be December of uh, 2020. All right, have any, uh, anything else to add? No, unless you have questions. Do I have any questions concerning the resolution? Hearing none, can I get a motion to accept the resolution as is presented? Chairman Griffin, I move. Seconded. Rita Hardy seconds. All right, it's been properly moved and second. Uh, discussion. Okay, hearing no discussion from the board, um, I'd like to, to uh, ask are there any objections to the resolution that's presented? Are there any abstentions to the resolution? Hearing now that the, the uh, resolution has to pass, pass unanimously. Thank you, Mr. McCurley. 
Um, you currently have the second item on the agenda also, a resolution authorizing the solicitation of proposals for the procurement of automation of background screening. This is a little bit different, but it uh, is also necessary to be brought before the board. I'm gonna go ahead and, and present Mr. McCurr. Absolutely. Uh, this is actually a follow-up to the first um, recommendation resolution that was just approved. Uh, again, um, we have a current contract with uh, First Choice Automated Background Screens to do our background screening currently. Uh, what we are asking is that uh, we get approval to seek solicitations for proposals uh, to rebid this uh, background screening service. Um, the estimated independent estimated cost uh, would be about five hundred and forty three thousand nine hundred and fifty nine dollars and sixty cents, which comes out to be about one hundred and eight thousand eight hundred dollars per year. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeking the services of a contractor that is proven with proven experience in conducting uh, pre employment screening for candidates considered for positions within the authority. Uh, the pre-employment screenings may consist of verification of employment, criminal history, credit checks, education, motor vehicle records reports, and uh, where applicable in other employment screenings as deemed necessary by MARTA. Uh, we utilize these background screenings to ensure that we obtain additional information to ensure that our applicants are um, deemed uh, employable, uh, ensuring the protection of our customers, employees, property, and information. All background, all criminal background screens and credit checks are done in compliance with the Fair Credit Reporting Act. All right, any other comments? Okay, uh, can I get a motion for, uh, to, um, can I get a motion to approve the resolution that's presented Worthy moves. Who was that? Who, who made the move? Who, who uh, approved the motion? Worthy. Worthy. Okay. So can I get a second? Griffin, second. All right. Be probably moved and second. Any questions from the board concerning this resolution? Okay. Hearing none. Um, are there any abstentions? Are there any objections to the resolution that's presented? Are there any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion has been approved uh, uh, by the majority of the board. Thank you, Mr. McCurdy. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. The next three items on the agenda are, are going to be presented by Mr. Kirk Calvert. Uh, the first item is a resolution authorizing a modification to a contractual authorization for the trapeze master agreement. Uh, Mr. Kirk Talbert, you want to go ahead and present? Kirk, I believe you are mute. You know what? I tell everyone that all the time, so it's ironic that it hit me. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for catching that. Uh, so this is a resolution requesting approval to modify our existing trapeze contract, number P34149, in an amount of $583,095 to add four additional modules of software that were being operated by MV in support of the mobility operations. And what we're doing is we're putting that software back into MARTA so that we can run and operate that software uh, in order to support the operational changes that were discussed earlier. So this resolution is requesting uh, an increase of that $583,000 and adding the scope of these four modules drive made application, the trip spark notification, um, the trip spark management portal, and the GTFS real-time reporting. Okay, any other uh, comments, Mr. Talbert? Okay, uh, um, go ahead. No, no I, I don't have any other parts of the presentation. Okay, uh, hearing none, can I get a, a motion to accept the resolution that's been presented before the board? Five minutes for approval. Okay, second. second. I have a question. Question. I got I got to get a second first. I asked Roberta seconds, and then I have a question as well. Okay, it's been moved to second. All right, question. 
Yes, um, just Kirk, can you um, just touch on how this amendment impacts your long term plans on CAD AVL? Yes, sir. Um, I believe that was Mr. Thomason. Uh, this will not have any impact on the CAD AVL piece. All that it's doing is we're currently. MV is operating this software on our behalf. We're moving this software over to MARTA so that we will continue to operate it. We will take the same information out of the software and make it available to uh, both internal operations as well as the public through the CAD AVL system. So the net impact is zero from a CAD AVL perspective. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Roberta? I do. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Kurt, I just wanted to ask you with bringing um, trapeze back in house uh, under MARTA's you know jurisdiction. Did you need to hire additional personnel, or do we have enough staff to, to cover that added function? No, we do uh, not need to add additional personnel. Um, the existing trapeze staff will be supporting it. And hinted at his point, we will continue our plans to find the best platform and best software going forward. This is just temporarily during the existing trapeze contracts. May I just add something to that? Um, and I don't know if Kali wants to add something. Really what we're doing here is um, the, we intend to continue to have a contractor be the operator of this system. What we want to do is to be the ones who are owning the licenses and having the data on our system so that if we, if and when we transition um, contractors, it's, it's, it's not going from the, uh, one contractor to the other. We're just leaving all of the data and all the systems on MARTA's system and allowing a new contractor to take over that. So it, it's really not a change from, a, from the implementation of the system. Um, clearly, Kirk staff will have to maintain the system where because it was on MV system before, um, you know, they were responsible, responsible for backups and, and things like that. So there, there is some additional responsibility, but we need this control to be able to uh, allow a smooth transition between contractors. All right, thank you, Mr. Parker. Are there any other questions? Hearing none, can I get a motion to approve the resolution presented by Mr. Talbot? Mr. Chair, we did a motion before questions. Oh, we did, okay. So all I need is a vote then. Uh, are there any objections to the resolution that's presented to the board? Are there any abstentions? Down the motion, um, the resolution is passed unanimously. Okay, the next item on the agenda is a resolution authorizing the modification and the contractual authorizations for employees online performance management system software. A contract RFP P44358. Uh, you're up again, Mr. Talbert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Parker. This is a resolution requesting a two year contract be entered in with Saba software. It is the current provider of our employee uh, performance management system, the, where we do our annual reviews and, and performance improvement plans and whatnot. This is an online uh, software as a service provision, and we have had a year to year uh, contract with this provider. When we looked at the, the changes in pricing is on a year to year model, we deemed it was in best interest uh, to enter into a two year contract with them so that we could lock in the rates. So the request here is adding $152,839.49 to the total spend so far with Saba uh, for two additional years. The annual cost of each year then is locked in at, uh, trying to find that number. Um, hold on a second, I've got it in my notes. The annual cost to lock in for, um, I've got too many screens going on, I apologize. The annual cost that that works out for is 
uh, $74,533.12 per year. So this is a request to enter into a two-year contract with Saba uh, in the amount of $152,839.49 to support the employee performance management system. Okay. All right, anything else? All right. Thank you, Mr. Caliber. And I get a motion to um, uh, well, we need to take a vote currently. So, all those who are opposed to the resolution, I hear the opposition. Mr. Fryson, we need a motion and a second. Okay. This is this is pretty hard. I move to accept the resolution. Okay. All right. Can I can I get a second? Roberta seconds. Okay, it's been properly moved and second. Uh, all those are who are opposed to the resolution. Anyone that opposed to the resolution? Hearing none. Are there any abstentions to the resolution? I hear none. The resolution has passed unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Talbert. So the next item is also for Mr. Kirk Talbert. Uh, it's item five on the agenda: resolution authorizing the expenditure of capital and operations operating funds for the general. Consulting and professional services for the Department of Technology in the fiscal year 2021. Mr. Albert. Thank you, uh, Dr. Frierson and uh, members of the board and Jeff Parker. This is a request for approval of the resolution uh, similar to the GCPS requests that were made earlier in the annual process. This is to expend six million six hundred seventy one thousand twenty six dollars and twenty cents on technical services and technical skills for fiscal year 21. I have on the screen a list or I will have on the screen momentarily and it should be in your packet a list of the projects that these technical services will be supporting. It's a range of technical services across the, the entire portfolio of projects that we have. Um, of note is this represents a 35% decrease in our dependency on outside technical skills as we're transitioning skills in-house. This lowers our overall spend um, and is down, as I said, 35% from last year's request. So I won't belabor you with all of the projects, but it's to bring in a host of services necessary to execute on our capital program for fiscal year 21. All right, thank you, Mr. Talbert. Can I get a motion to uh, to approve the resolution? I move. It's Frida. Frida, and can I get a second? Worthy. All right. Uh, it's been moved and second. Uh, are there any discussions concerning the resolution? Hearing none. Uh, I would like to know: Are there any objections to the resolution that's been presented to the board? No objections. Are there any abstentions? No abstentions. Hearing none, the resolution has been properly moved, has been approved. Thank you, Mr. Tauber. Thank All you, right. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The last item that we have on the agenda, well, we have a couple, but this one here is another resolution uh, to, uh, to adopt the fiscal year 2021 operating and capital funds budget. And Mr. Kevin Hurley, he's going to present the resolution. Mr. Hurley, are you on? Yes, sir, Mr. Frierson, I'm, I'm here this morning. Okay. Um, Kirk, did you want to run the slide or do you want to give me permission to do so? I just gave you, per, oh, I'm in the process of giving you permission, if you would prefer. It tends to yeah, that better. works. All right. All right. Okay, let's see here. What am I going to? that one and I will go here. Can you all see that slide there? Uh, I can on my hand. If everybody else can see it? Yes. Okay. This is the same as the book, right? Uh, yes, sir. This is this. Uh, they're similar. There's there's a few slides in here that are different, um, but some of them are the same. Sure. All right. Good morning, Mr. Frierson, members of the Business Management Committee and Mr. Parker. I'm here to do two things. First, to give a presentation on the FY21 operating and capital budgets, and then subsequently 
offer the resolution to approve them for your um, consideration. Mm -hmm. These are the items that we're gonna discuss this morning. We're gonna discuss the virtual public hearings, the FY21 operating budget, the FY21 capital budget, and then predominantly next steps. As you know, to help mitigate um, the exposure and spread of the coronavirus, MARTA decided to hold uh, virtual public budget public hearings this year, and we conducted two hearings. One was held on May 18th, and the second was held on May 19th. We use multiple platforms to hold those, those meetings. Um, the first there indicated is social media, where we use YouTube Live and Facebook Live. We also used uh, and live streamed on itsmarta.com. And for those uh, patrons and stakeholders that didn't have access to internet or social media, we provided a dial-in phone number so they could listen in on the presentations. I wanted to point out that this was uh, the first time we've ever done budget public hearings in this format. And so the external affairs department really put forth an aggressive um, digital community outreach strategy. And this, it was geared towards minimizing face-to-face -face engagement while maximizing exposure and awareness for the public. Um, the outreach elements that, that external affairs utilized was social media, communications and media relations through press releases, uh, stakeholder and government engagement, um, directly engaging um, some of our elected officials and other stakeholders. They used station signage and community partner outreach uh, to you know, local jurisdictions as well as our business partners to share the information as well. This slide is meant to show the results of, those pub of the public hearing participation. The May 19th hearing had 757 unique, unique Facebook Live viewers, 114 YouTube Live playbacks, and 10 dial-in participants. The May 19th hearing had 1,096 Facebook Live participants, 99 YouTube Live playbacks, and 14 dial-in participants. Overall, for the two hearings, Facebook totaled 1,853 viewers, and YouTube Live had 213. In addition, the dial-in option garnered 24 users, and you know, across the two days, so that's a significant number of views and users. Um, in addition, we also uh, provided a pre-hearing video that was made available, which had 393 unique viewers and 525 total views. Um, in addition, you'll note there that it said media not identified. Um, we do know that media participated. We just don't know how many. We received um, several reporters submitted questions to external relations for clarification after the hearings. Um, overall, you know, my perception is this was a very successful series of hearings. The number of individuals that um, were in attendance dramatically exceed the number that we typically see at a regular budget hearing in person. So this is something that uh, I think it was very welcome to see the interest. Now we'll step into the FY21 operating budget. I wanted to start it off with showing uh, the new org chart. And this org chart is um, something that you have seen last week but wasn't in the initial presentation and it's been adjusted as a result of the retirement of Chief Dunham and some uh, alignment changes that the general manager put in place a few weeks ago. This slide you've also seen previously and it shows a comparison between FY19 actuals, FY20 budget, and the FY21 proposed budget there in column three. 
and I'd like to direct you to um, the net operating expenses, which is almost in the middle of the page there. It's presenting a, an FY21 expense budget of $557.9 million. This is inclusive of uh, the $20 million COVID-19 contingency fund. That's what we will be asking for approval um, later today. Uh, if you'll note in the personnel summary, this is the same summary that you had seen in prior uh, in a prior presentation. But I wanted to include it here because staff had made a commitment to perform a downsizing effort related to um, positions, and we're still working on that effort. And prior to uh, the board adopting this fully on June 11th, we will. Um, present to you the results of that downsizing effort. So I wanted to include where we are today, right now, and then subsequently follow up with where we, we are after we've gone through that effort. This is a picture of the sources of operating funds by category. You'll note that the total operating revenue sources is $624.5 million the largest of which is still the sales tax that we see there for $241.9 million, followed by the CARES Act funding that we anticipate of $150 million. The third largest source is passenger revenue at 104.7, and then federal operating assistance at 81.9, and some other transit-related revenue as well. I did want to point out that the, the way we derived this revenue um, budget was to look at the FY21, the pre-COVID forecast of 538.2 million, and we subtracted out what our estimate of the impact of COVID-19 on these sources um, would entail. That's 63.8 million. And then we would add back in the, the CARES Act funding, the maximum amount that we felt we could consume in FY21. So that's how this uh, revenue budget was derived. A little too quick there. This slide presents where does MARTA plan to execute the proposed $557.9 million of expenditures? And you can see that 364.8 of that is for labor. Transit is a labor intensive operation, so that's where the preponderance of it is spent. It's followed by contractual services at 89.5 million, materials and supplies at 43.1 million, and then I'd like to point out that COVID-19 contingency that we've budgeted for in FY21. Now we'll step into the capital budget. This picture presents a total of 854.9 million in sources of funds that are available to support the FY21 capital budget. They include, as you see there, a $301.1 million prior year carryover. This is inclusive of City of Atlanta and Clayton County reserve funds which we'll di be discussing a little bit later. Sales tax is also uh, a very large provider for the capital program at 270.6 million. And debt issue is anticipated in the range of 210 million to support the FY21 capital program. There are an additional uh, sum of federal dollars, 72.7 million that are also anticipated to support the program in FY21. This slide presents um, where MARTA is going to expend these capital funds, and, and the 559 million in capital funds by asset category. On this presentation, the largest is debt service at $159.1 million, and it's followed by um, the systems component of the capital program at 123.1 and facilities 
at 103.7. Vehicles, you know, obviously we put out service and we need vehicles, so 76.6 million of that is, uh, of this year's program is designed to support vehicle procurement. And then um, I'd like to point out here over on the, the left, my left-hand side, the more MARTA Clayton and the more MARTA City of Atlanta pie slices, we will discuss those a little bit later on their own. This is a depiction of the 10-year capital program. This program is fundable. Um, it, it falls within the constraints issued by the, the board and the MARTA Act, and we're able to execute this program. Um, please note that this program does not include the More Mars City of Atlanta or Clayton projects. Those will be discussed here in the coming slides. This slide is meant to step into the capital program um, a, a little bit of a, in a little bit of a more detail and shows the breakout of the 10-year plan by asset categories that we track. So, You'll note there that it's broken, about, broken out by vehicles, facilities and stations, maintenance of way, systems, and non-assets. Um, in addition, Frank has pulled out the in infrastructure support soft costs because that's something that we're targeting to um, address as we go forward. We're trying to drive those soft costs down as low as we possibly can. If, if you can't see it, you, you you don't, um, it can be out of sight, out of mind. So Frank wanted to pull that out. So it's something that we have to look at every day and make sure we're trying to address. This next slide steps in the, into a little more detail and it's showing the top 10 capital projects by expense for FY21. It also, show, ugh, it also shows the 10 year total for those individual projects. So as you can see, station rehab, track renovation, new rail cars, tunnel ventilation, those are um, the largest consumers in FY21. And if you look into the 10-year total column, you'll also see station rehab and rail cars as large consumers going forward in the 10-year plan. Those are both multi-year projects that we anticipate um, sizable investments throughout this 10-year period. One other item I'd like to point out is that these top 10 projects consume 55% of the budget for the FY21 CIP. Very large in comparison to the rest of the projects. Now here's where we get into the City of Atlanta, More Marta, and the More Marta Clayton. These are the sources of funds for both of these entities. So we'll step through them one by one. The first one is the, for the city of Atlanta. There's a current reserve balance of $88.5 million and additional proceeds will be generated this year uh, post COVID um, or COVID adjust as I, adjusted, I guess you'd say, of about $27.2 million. This would bring the, the funding total to 115.7 million available to support Mormar to City of Atlanta. And then on the Clayton side of things, the beginning balance for the reserve was 122.6 million with anticipated proceeds to increase um, COVID adjusted by about $26.8 million, bringing uh, the funds available for Clayton to 149 0.4 million. So these are the sources that we're going to utilize going forward on the Clayton Capital Initiatives, uh, Clayton and City of Atlanta Capital Initiatives that we've been discussing. This slide presents the FY21 capital investment for the City of Atlanta. It's a total of 13 projects requiring funds in FY21 for a total of $16.75 million. You can see here the largest investments are for Five Points, the Streetcar East, Campbellton Road, and Capitol Avenue, Summerhill. 
The others, there's some smaller amounts being utilized for initial planning on these other projects. The projects that have zeros, that just means that there's no funding programmed in FY21. They are in the 10-year plan and expenses on those are anticipated in future coming years. This slide presents the same for uh, Clayton County. There's a total of six projects for $8.9 million. The largest project being Clayton BRT and planning on the Clayton HCT option. This is followed by the purchase of real estate for the Clayton maintenance facility and the initial efforts going into the design of the facility. Um, and one other item I'd like to point out is the contingency for Clayton County. We established at $3.3 million. Uh, that can be used for some additional planning efforts on other components and or, um, you know, potentially, you know, projects are moving a little faster than we anticipate. We, we would have the funds available to support those. All right, so what are the next steps? You know, as mentioned earlier, staff is conducting a position reduction exercise that will complete before June 11th. And so, so we, we anticipate getting that done and, and reporting back to you during that meeting. Uh, subsequently the, to this discussion, the BMC will be asked to approve the resolution for the FY21 operating and capital budgets. And if you do approve it today, it'll go to the full board on June 11th for adoption. And based on a prior discussion with the board in our last presentation, uh, staff will monitor FY21 actual performance as compared to budget for potential challenges and implement a mid-year adjustment if necessary. It's definitely something that the board will be aware of as we go through the fiscal year and um, if a mid-year adjustment becomes necessary, we will bring that to the board's attention. Um, another request presented by the board was to, you know, we give standard quarterly performance reports. What, what we plan to do during those quarterly performance reports is incorporate um, updates on the execution of the CARES Act funding draws as a result of a question presented by um, the board in a prior meeting. So in addition to the fact that we're, we're going to ask you to adopt the budget today and then the board approve on it, approve it on June 11th, there's some considerations that you had put forth that we will handle going forward into the, into the fiscal year and keep you abreast of all, all the items you had requested. So with that, I, I thank you for your time and reviewing and listening to the presentation today. And I'd like to formally request your approval of the resolution to approve the FY21 operating and capital budgets. Thank you, Mr. Hurley. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Hurley? Mr. Yes, hi, um, Mr. Chair, I have a question. Yes, uh, Frida, I mean, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Scott. Yes. Uh, we have in DeKalb County, I have received several calls and emails, concerns from various community groups and elected officials regarding the uh, budget information that's online as opposed to received in mail. Is there a difference in what is actually online as opposed to what? this booklet that I'm holding in hand or that what you just now? Uh, yes, ma'am, Th they should be one in the same. There were no adjustments made as a result of the public hearings. So what was presented to the public is exactly what was presented here today. Okay, and my other question, I guess I have two more questions. Uh, we received, and I know the MARTA board and MARTA itself received questions from a community group concerned citizens for effective government regarding the process and the format for the budget. Are we in line as to the presentation of the budget being 
parallel with what is called for in the MARTA Act? Uh, yes, ma'am. I I do believe that we are, but I would um, you know ask Liz to step in to confirm that. Sure. Yes, we um, we are compliant with the the requirements of the MARTA Act. I, I think that one of the concerns was it was presented a little bit differently this year than it had in um, previous years. But I believe we have addressed the concerns um, from the group that you were uh, referencing, Ms. Scott. Okay. Great. Uh, then my last question, and I may have missed it. I know that uh, the state of good repair at the Indian Creek train station is supposed to start in 2020. I didn't see any funding. I'm sure it will continue into 2021. Uh, yes, ma'am. That that funding in particular is part of the station rehabilitation program. And there are funds available in FY21 to support that initiative. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, we have another question from the board members. Any other questions? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, this is Roberta. I was asking Mr. Hurley um, on the uh, project list, the top 10 project uh, budgets by cost. Um, I don't see um, any projects on this list for Clayton. Is that because we're going to be separated out in the budget or we just don't have anything as a priority for the next 10 years? Uh, Ms. Lam, the the projects on this list are the top 10 spend for FY21. And if you, I'll flip back here to the Clayton side here. And the largest expense in FY21 alone is the Clayton BRT um, 1.7 million. So it just didn't reach the level of expense as these other projects that were indicated. This list right here on slide 19 shows those that are anticipated in Clayton and FY21. Once um, we get a little further ahead on the maintenance facility, I think you'll see those expenses starting to increase. So Kevin, Kevin on if I may uh, assist with that response, uh, if, if, um, if you go to the state of good repair budget, there's money in that budget for acquisition of properties associated, it's not shown on these slides, properties associated with the O&M facility as well as beginning the, the detailed planning and design portion of that facility. So in that facility, if you look at the 10-year the uh, basically projection, we are looking at spending somewhere in the range of 110 to $115 million on that facility. Yeah, but I, I guess the criteria is what, what um, because I see some of them are, you know, as low as 21 uh, million, and um, I, I'm not understanding this, why it didn't this, make this is, this is right state of point. good repair projects, not the expansion projects. Just a little bit of clarification. Yeah, so just so those are state of state budgets. These are the top 10 projects. They are state of good repair projects, not the expansion projects. Okay. Two different groupings. Yeah, it would help if we could signify. Well, it's, so it's an expansion. Okay. Well, oh, yeah. but, um, who, who, uh, who had a comment next? Mr. Do you have any more comments? No, I was just on the top 10 project. Okay. I think Mr. Mr. Rucker, you commented on that, correct? Yes, we, we, when, when we look at the capital budget, we look at expansion projects and that was, that would be the, the follow on slides. Plus we look at state of good repair and the state of good repair projects normally consist of projects that help to maintain the system. All right. Okay. So if, if you look at all the projects there, they are projects which are, are basically associated with the existing system as it deals with Clayton County. Kevin and show those slides, but I was just trying to clarify. Clayton County has some major projects. Number one, the state, the the O and M facility is scheduled to really take off with this year, as well as we're beginning to do some real study on the BRTs and and looking at the high capacity transit, which is commuter rail. Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. Rucker. All right, I had another question, I believe, from one of the board members. Maybe on mute. Uh, you have another question? All right, hearing no other questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Curley. Appreciate it very much. Uh, can I get a motion to accept uh, the budget as presented by Mr. Hurley to the board? This is Frida Hardish. I move. Second. 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 Seconds. Uh, Mr. Is that Mr. Pond? Yes. Okay, Mr. Pond is seconded. Okay, it's been moved and second. I hear it. Are there any other questions concerning the uh, budget or the resolution that's been presented by Mr. Hurley for the board? Uh, Mr. Chair, I do have one question. Yes, Mr. Pond. Uh, Kevin mentioned about evaluating the staff and that would be done in the next few weeks would that reflect a change in the budget or would that be a normal just operations thing uh, rolling forward uh yes sir mr pond the we took into consideration a 2.7 million dollar reduction in labor costs and then now um, it's already factored into the numbers themselves we're now um, executing um, a reduction in headcount to support that reduction of 2.7 million in cost. Okay. So it won't change the number, but it'll reduce the headcount. Now, going forward, it's something that we'll continue to look at as well. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Powell. Any other questions? Okay, it's been properly moved and second. Are there any oppositions to the budget that's presented by Mr. Hurley? Are there any abstentions to the budget? Hearing none. Uh, it's a abstains, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Roberta, Ms. Roberta do? Yes, sir. We have one abstention. Okay, any other abstention to the budget? Mr. Chair, I do not abstain. I vote yes, as long as the question I asked has been clarified, and that is all the presentations in the budget have been met the criteria based upon the MARTA Act. I just wanted to make that comment. Okay. All right, so we have one abstention, no objections. The motion carries. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I do understand some reservations concerning the budget and how it was presented to the public. Uh, I had raised some questions also, uh, Mrs. Scott, and it was my understanding we were in compliance, and so it's available for the public to see. Any other questions that we need to bring before this uh, board? Okay, hearing none, um, I'd like to, to adjourn this meeting for the Business Management Committee. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. What a day. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. All right. Now take care. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs>